Uh, all right. So in this reading, there's kind of like four different kind of miscellaneous things I'm going to talk about. Um, the first one is paternal dominion. And um, should I have them all up to begin with? Uh, now nah, I'll play with the other ones when I get to them. So, um, so paternal dominion. Um, Hobbes discusses this under the topic of commonwealth by acquisition, which I already talked about quite a bit. Um, so, but uh, commonwealth by acquisition, the usual way we think about it is like someone conquering people and making them agree uh, to be their subjects uh, in exchange for not killing them. <laughs> That's the, that's the contract that starts uh, Commonwealth by acquisition. But um, according to Hobbes, there's another kind of, well, dominion by acquisition. It could be a Commonwealth. So dominion, right? Dominion means like, uh, like mastership, right? Like being a master. Um, so uh, uh, the, uh, the dominion of the sovereign in a commonwealth is like a sub kind of dominion. Paternal dominion is at least potentially a different sub kind of dominion. Um, uh, but it's, uh, I'm putting the right thing first. Um, I guess, I mean, I'll just say right away that the, the, the difference between dominion of the sovereign in a commonwealth and other types of dominion, according to Hobbes, is really just the size. The commonwealth, remember, he says it has to be big enough to like ensure the security of all its members against foreign invaders. If it's small enough that the foreign invaders, and he says when uh, when he discussed this way back when, he said that there isn't a fixed number. It depends on like what kind of foreign invaders are around, <laughs> basically, right? But it has to be enough that, you know, um, they aren't going to be able to just like call in one more, hey, come join us, and then they'll defeat, right? It has to be enough that basically they're going to, all potential foreign invaders are going to be afraid of invading. I mean, because otherwise, uh, as he says here, when he discusses, actually he says this in the case of paternal dominion, that if you have a small group um, that has some kind of covenant for, yeah. Would there be some kind of like balancing point? Because if you're big enough to display other people from invading you, you might be big enough to want to invade other people. Yeah, well, that's fine, <laughs> right? I mean, that is, according to Hobbes, that's fine. <laughs> Right, but the problem is if other people are, are strong enough to invade you, then, and it's like known that they're strong enough to invade you, or at least there's a, there's a serious worry about that, then, you know, if here's your small group here, and um, meanwhile, there's this big invader here who might want to invade, so this member has to, like, as usual, weigh the consequences of their actions. You know, 
like taking into account good and bad things that might happen. So like if they can do something to um, like help this invader that will just that will be in disobedience to the laws of this small group, their calculation is going to be well, chances of them being able to enforce that against me versus the chance of them being able to is great. Like these people are stronger. So, right, so as Hobbes says, whenever there's danger of invasion or whatever, if this group is too small, then everyone, you know, reverts to their usual right of deciding how to defend themselves. Right, so, I mean, um, that, that's the only difference, though, according to Hobbes. So, I mean, this is important because when we turn to Locke and Rousseau, they're going to say, no, so-called paternal dominion is completely different from political dominion. Um, but so, um, so paternal dominion, Hobbes says, um, first of all, is the right of dominion, quote, by generation, right? Where generation means like reproduction, right? So that this is in chapter 20, paragraph four on page 128. But it turns out that as he discusses it in more detail, so I mean, what this seems to mean is that like the father gets some right and great paternal means it's the father. The father gets some right over the children because he generates. But as you go more into Hobbes' detailed discussion, um, it turns out that uh, the type of dominion Hobbes is discussing here isn't really exactly due to generation, and it isn't really exactly paternal. And, um, and Hobbes, like, proves both of those things by mentioning something that he doesn't forget, namely that there isn't only a father, but there's also a mother. And she also generated the children. Right? So, um, So here, this is again is in uh, chapter 20, paragraph four on page 128. And is not so derived from the generation as if therefore the parent had dominion over his child because he begat him, but from the child's consent, either express or by other sufficient arguments declared. And the, the little like caption in the margin, which is, which is also Hobbes says, not by generation, but by contract. For as to generation, God hath ordained to man a helper, and there be always two that are equally parents. The dominion therefore over the child should belong equally to both, and he be equally subject to both, which is impossible, for no man can obey two masters. Right, so what he's saying is, if this kind of dominion were really by generation, that since there are two parents, it would belong to both of them equally, and Hobbes says that's impossible. Why is that impossible? For the usual reason he thinks any kind of divided government is impossible. What if they disagree with each other? Who's going to decide? Right? So having two people with like equal and complete rights of dominion is uh, um, it's it amounts to no one having to do so it's not really by generation and it's not really paternal because um and this is i think is i think i read this before i don't remember in what context but and whereas some have attributed the dominion to the man only, 
as being of the more excellent sex, they misreckon in it. For there is not always that difference of strength or prudence between the man and the woman as that right can be determined without war. Oh yeah, I guess I read this at the very beginning when I was when he was saying that like in a state of nature, all men are equal. And I was saying that I think that includes that man there is supposed to include women, right? And you can tell from this place here, although it's a little ambiguous because it says there is not always that difference. Like is there sometimes that difference? But I think the point is, it's, you know, um, it's actually, I mean, it's similar to his general take about human equality in the state of nature. He doesn't feel like he has to prove that everyone is exactly equal. He just has to prove that no one is reliably stronger, right? Like no one can be sure they're strong enough to defeat someone else in a fight. And that's enough, that means, that they all have equal rights, namely the right to everything. <laughs> right? So similarly, in this case, he's saying, you know, if you think, actually, we'll see an argument like this in Locke, although, but he's changed the context of the question a lot. So it's not clear that what Hobbes is saying somehow goes against it. But, you know, if you think that because, uh, I don't know, men are stronger on average than women, definitely on average, right? Like lots of women are stronger than me, but you know what I mean? So uh, if you think that like that's gonna settle it somehow, he's gonna say, well, look, they're, they're not so much stronger on average than the end can be sure who would win in a fight. The weakest is strong enough to defeat the strongest. And therefore there's, that's no way of establishing dominion. Right? If it's going to be established, just if we're going to say, okay, you know, the father is going to tell every, or the father is going to tell the children what to do, right? Like this, this doesn't say anything about the dominion, dominion of the parents over each other. This is all about the parents and the children. But um, um, you know, if 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 we say, oh, the parent, the father is going to tell the children what to do, and they'll listen to him because he's stronger, you know. The answer is, well, no, they're always going to be reckoning that maybe he's not strong, right? Or maybe his, even if he is stronger, his strength won't help him, right? Because they, again, even the weakest can, can kill the strongest by either by cunning or by ganging up with others, et cetera. Um, so therefore he says, now, I mean, this is a little weird because, I mean, so basically he says, in a state of nature, um, uh, who, which parent gets dominion? Well, he says, either the parents can make a contract with each other and say, okay, you're going to get dominion, or um, if not, he says, dominion goes to the mother. Um, because he says, uh, for in the condition, this is paragraph five on page 129. If there be no contract, the dominion is in the mother. For in the condition of mere nature, where there are no matrimonial laws, it cannot be known who the father is, who is the father, unless it be declared by the mother. And therefore, the right of dominion over the child dependeth on her will and is consequently hers, right? So he says, how do we know who the father is? We know who the mother is, <laughs> right? But uh, how do we know who the father is? The mother has to tell us. Now, I mean, it's, this is all a little bit weird in the sense that, like, in a state of nature, how are they making these contracts? Or, like, who is it that, the, you know, the mother is telling who the father is? I guess she's telling the children? I'm not sure. Right? It's a state of nature. So they, it's not like they're in a court, you know, trying to settle a like, custody battle, like in a forest with acorns. And uh, um, so, I mean, my guess is, like, he's, it's not so much 
he's not like trying to settle the details of like state of nature family law. Right, I mean, you know, when you're in a state of nature, what's going to happen is there's going to be a war of all against all. So, uh, you know, it doesn't really matter that much who the dominion really belongs to in a state of nature. But I think he's just trying to, um, like, establish what part of the. Um, law about families in commonwealths is like is is due to later conventions it's like a matter of civil law made for certain purposes um so so he's i mean Yeah, it's like it's not so much about what would actually happen in the state of nature as like okay you know if you forget everything you know about our commonwealth's laws who should the dominion belong to and he's saying basically well if there were no agreement and no laws we don't belong to our mother um but if there is an agreement it belongs to whoever they say Right, so it um, doesn't have to belong to the mother. Uh, it doesn't have to belong to either the mother or the father. Um, so, uh, like to put these pieces together, basically what's happening in a state of nature is number one, there's gonna be a covenant between the children and um, one of the parents, and the parents are going to decide who that which one that is, and if they don't decide, it will be the mother. Why is there going to be a covenant between the children and one of the parents? Well, uh, um, and this is why it's a commonwealth by acquisition or dominion by acquisition because the parents have the power to kill the children, <laughs> right? Like the children can't take care of themselves. So that's why also he says later on in chapter five, in a paragraph five at the bottom of page 129, but if she expose it and another find and nourish it, maybe I should start a little bit earlier. Again, seeing the infant is first in the power of the mother, so she may either nourish or expose it, right? Expose it. This is talking about the kind of infanticide they did in like ancient Greece and Rome, where they would just leave the baby out to die. <laughs> I'm laughing, not because it's funny, just whatever. Okay, anyway, again, seeing the infant is first in the power of the mother, so she may either nourish or expose it, if she nourish it, it oweth its life to the mother and is therefore obliged to obey her rather than any other. And by consequence, the dominion over it is hers. But if she expose it and another, another find and nourish it, the dominion is in him that nourisheth it. Nourisheth it. <laughs> For it ought to obey him by whom it is preserved. Because preservation of life being the end for which one man becomes subject to another, Every man is supposed to promise obedience to him in whose power it is to save or destroy him. Right? So, like, if the, um, so the truth is, it's really not by generation at all. It's just that the parents are the ones who are likely to be around and have the choice whether to preserve the infant or destroy it. But if someone else preserves the infant, then this dominion goes to that person, right? Like the adopted parent. Um, and then there's one more question that Hobbes has to answer in this area, which is, um, and I think this is the point of view from which you have to look at what he's saying here. The question is, well, okay, if all this is true, how come 
within a common law. Now, I mean, so in a state of nature, at least when the children are small, I mean, it, this is weird because he said in other places that children can't make a covenant because they don't have the use of reason. So when they reach their use of reason, presumably they've also become strong enough to take care of themselves. So it's not clear at what point this covenant got made. But anyway, in a state of nature, at least when the children are small, you know, one of the parents has dominion over them and it's absolute dominion. They don't answer to anyone else. And that's the point at which he says, and if the family is big enough, then it becomes a little common and it's a monarch. Right? And it's a monarchy by acquisition. Um, but now, once we're in a commonwealth, you might think there would be no paternal dominion. Right? Because everyone has authorized the sovereign. So, what room is there left for paternal dominion? Um, in other words, the sovereign like tells you what your parent wanted wants you to do as, as far as it concerns the common peace and security, and they authorize them. And if they don't tell you anything, that should mean that you're free. Um, so, I mean, that's one question. And another question is. You know, but so that's a, that's a question because we, in fact, we find that in Commonwealth there is paternal dominion, or at least um, uh, well, I mean, there is definitely some kind of paternal dominion. We'll we'll see Locke trying to break that down into different sources. But that's number one. And then the other question is, and how come Hobbes in the Commonwealth we know about, but dominion always seems to go to the father, no conscience. So, um, and the reason I, I say you have to put in that context is I don't think he's trying to come up with an argument for this in advance, in the sense that like he wants to show that it should go to the father. He's dealing with an objection where like everyone knows it goes to the father. He's trying to explain why, but his explanation is weird. And this is the explanation. It's in the middle of paragraph four on page one, bottom of page one twenty-eight. In Commonwealths, this controversy is decided, but there is a controversy about which parent should have dominion. In Commonwealths, this controversy is decided by the civil law, and for the most part, but not always, the sentence is in favor of the father. Because for the most part, commonwealths have been erected by the fathers, not by the mothers of families. So that, I mean, so on the one hand, that tells us something. It probably tells us something about why there's paternal dominion, even in a commonwealth. Because commonwealths, it seems like, actually are really produced by families getting together in a state of nature. Not by individuals getting together. In the state of nature. Um, so it seems like I mean, part of the covenant they made is that, I mean, not that he says any of this, but it, I'm just, it seems like what's going on is that part of the covenant they made is that they're authorizing the sovereign um, to take care of con peace and security, but they're not giving up the right where the sovereign doesn't say anything one way or the other to tell their children what to do. So that's why there's still some kind of paternal dominion inside a commonwealth. Now, I mean, the, the sovereign can suspend it at any moment, right? The sovereign individual or assembly can vote, you know, can say, well, here's a law, you know, if you do this to your children, we're going to take them away. Right? I mean, we have laws like that. So uh, I don't think Hobbes has any objection to that. But as long as there isn't a law like that, the, the original paternal dominion is still in place. But the other part of the explanation, why it's the father, is hard to understand. I mean, it seems to raise more questions 
the answers. Why is it the commonwealths were mostly formed by the fathers and not by the mothers? Yeah. Is he trying to make like a commentary on the fact that like that up until that point most societies were just dominated by men? Well, but he's trying to explain that, right? I mean, you know, and the explanation seems to beg the question, right? Like, I mean, so he's explaining actually, you know, so he's he's explaining that uh, that the commonwealths we know about are, I mean, I guess this is at least one thing you might mean literally by patriarch. Yeah. They were formed by fathers, <laughs> and therefore they give special right to fathers. You know, just like if they had been formed by, I don't know, people who, you know, like ice cream or something, they would give, they would have special provisions for ice cream. They're formed by fathers, and so they give special rights to fathers. But why were they formed by fathers? Right? Like, that's what he doesn't explain. I mean, because he doesn't give any reason to think in a state of nature that most families would be headed by fathers. On the contrary, he gives plenty of reason to think that a lot, if not all, would be headed by mothers. So I'm not sure what the answer to this is, like what Hobbes is actually thinking. Um, but um, obviously, it's it's kind of important. <laughs> uh, um, I mean, does he just think it's by accident that the commonwealth around here were part of, you know, or something like that? But he doesn't say that. Yeah. So just to clarify, is is this a commentary on like the implicit bias of men in patriarchal society to give themselves dominion over children? Well, you mean on Hobbes's part? So, well, I mean, it's not a commentary on an implicit bias, right? It's asserting a pretty explicit bias, right? Yeah. He's saying that because they were formed by fathers, they, in the state of nature, there was no law that fathers should be head of families, but the commonwealths were formed by fathers. And so when they formed, and, and, and again, it seems like, yeah, you know, I mean, if we think about, like, for example, ancient republics, you know, this is how they work. How they worked, basically, it was like the fathers of families who had the vote, not our own house. You know, so. Um, uh, but he's like, but of course, like we don't know how they were formed, really. But he's projecting that back in time and saying they must have been formed by fathers of families. Um, um, but, you know. But you can't explain that by something they picked up in a patriarchal society because this is the beginning of a patriarchal society. Where did it come from? He doesn't explain. Yeah. Um, is it possibly just based on how, it, because this is 17th century Europe, how the church had basically run things for centuries and centuries and centuries and had this dogmatic teaching that, that God was the head of man and man the head of woman and that's the way everything was? Well, you know, so, I mean, someone could say that. In fact, I mean, we'll see that Locke. So it was taken for granted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so, and we'll see that Locke is arguing with this guy, Kilmer, who, who wrote, so, like, his book was called Patriarcha, which, you know, that's, I guess, where patriarchy actually comes from. But um, who did make that kind of, like, you know, he said, oh, God gave the kingship to Adam. And we'll see, like, Locke taking that to pieces. But, 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 but the thing is that, but Hobbes is not doing that, right? Like he's not taking it for granted by any means. In fact, he's arguing it's not natural. Right from the nature. It's like, it. yeah, it's like a conspiracy, basically. It's a conspiracy of the fathers who formed the Commonwealth to do this. But he's, but so, yeah, I mean, I don't think he's taking anything for granted here, but what he's not doing is um, explaining why this happened. That's, you know, so, um, all right, so anyway, that's all that Hobbes says about this, basically. Um, but it's important to keep in mind what he says about it, because um, Locke and Rousseau, and of course, especially Wollstonecraft, are going to um, number one, 
not agree that there's such a thing as paternal dominion in the way Hobbes thinks there is, but you know, then they're going to ex explain in their own way what kind of authority parents do have over children and so forth. Um, yeah, okay, so anyway, that's just, um, I don't know, maybe someday I'll understand that. Maybe he wrote something about it somewhere else. It's just, but like that sentence I read to you is always <laughs> because of commonwealths for the most part were formed by fathers of families. He repeats as, a, as, as history the story that the Amazon, uh, you know, uh, had a society of all women and they contracted with men from elsewhere and they gave them the male children, they kept the female children. Um, so, uh, you know, as, so when he says not always, he means, yeah, there are exceptions, but as far as he knows, this is what usually happens. And, um, it sounds like he's explaining it, but he isn't like, <laughs> okay, anyway, that's all I know how to say. I mean, yeah, I can't even think why he would be. Can't even think why, like he would. Maybe he has an explanation that he doesn't want to say, but I can't think what it would be. Anyway, okay. So that was one thing I wanted to talk about. Like I said, this this lecture is a little bit just divided into pieces. I mean, so the next thing I wanted to talk about is propriety of speech. So, um, so you remember that um, Hobbes says science is based on definition. Um, Make this down, but um, well, I mean, so yeah, I can't find the exact the somewhere where he says, and therefore you should you have to be very careful with definitions to make sure that your terms are defined correctly. But the question is, um, what do you mean make sure they're defined correctly? Like, what could be wrong with a definition? <laughs> you know, like I could define it however I want. It's my word, right? Um, So, well, I mean, there's some ways that are kind of obvious, right? That like, uh, if you don't have a definition, if you don't even have a possible definition, if you don't really mean anything by the word, right? Which is what Hobbes, uh, uh, Hobbes says is true of his scholastic terminology, hypothesis, whatever. Um, um, or you could like not stick to your definition. You can kind of like, go back and forth. Um, but it seems like he's also worried that um, that you might give a definition, but it might you might define your terms wrongly. And when you define your terms wrongly, you'll be using them improperly. Um, so what does it mean to define them improperly? or to use them wrongly. So, I mean, the first thing I wanna point out is that, as I mentioned before, this is, this 
this word propriety is also Hobbes' word, word for property. Um, and I think it's, uh, it's not just like a pun that he calls this propriety also. I'm not sure exactly how far the analogy is supposed to go, but like you can say at least um, that first of all, if a word has a proper meaning, that means I do some kind of wrong when I use it other times. Right? Just like property means that um, there's some kind of injustice in my doing. There's like a rule against it. So it's the same thing with using the word improperly. And the second thing that is similar here is that this kind of property or propriety in both cases is artificial, right? Like in a state of nature, there is, um, you know, like considered from the point of view of people in a state of nature, there's no difference between me taking this book home and you taking this book home. Somehow we created this artificial rule that makes it right for me to take it home because it's my book and wrong for you to take it home. So similarly, in, you know, viewed from the point of view of a state of linguistic nature, so to speak, there's nothing that says that the word book should mean this rather than this. Right? So, um, if there's something wrong with saying, like, look at this book. <laughs> um, so like that, that's not by nature, but it's somehow a human being have created this artificial rule. Um, and like these rules are, are created towards a certain end. So we know in the case of what you know what we call property, like or the broad version of we call property, exclusive rights of one kind or another. We know that Hobbes says the end for which these rules are created is peace. Meaning always right, peace within the commonwealth, of course. As I was saying before, like if you say, well, who says your commonwealth isn't going to conquer other commonwealths? Bob says, good, great, conquer other commonwealths. Okay, it's peace within the commonwealth. So they, these rules are produced for the purpose of peace within the commonwealth. So for what purposes are the um, rules of proper and improper speech created? Because if they're because so in other words, like what makes the rules of property um, um, actually limit my rights according to Hobbes? Well, it's um, it's the fact that I can be expect I can expect to be punished if I violate them, but why can I expect to be punished if I violate them? Well, because everyone made this covenant for the purpose of peace. So it's, you know, so basically it's because these rules are for the purpose of peace and peace is a like universal end that everyone wills. Um, that's why these rules limit my rights. So similarly, in the case of language, you know, um, somehow the purpose we have language for must be what like um, makes it wrong for me to violate these artificial rules of language. So Hobbes is have like a whole list of the uses of speech. This is in chapter four, paragraph three on page 16 to 17. It's not really that surprising. It's pretty much, I'm not even gonna read it. It's pretty much what you would expect. It's like, number one, to keep track of our own thoughts and passions to ourselves. Number two, to communicate them to others. And furthermore, to reason, counsel, 
command and to entertain. Right? I think that's his whole list. So, um, okay, so I, as I said, that's not so surprising. Um, but I think uh, what um, so that is to the extent that people want all those things, uh, they want everyone to follow the rules that allow those things to happen, even though those rules are artificial. You know. Um, however, and this is uh, now I'm going to read from chapter 25, paragraph one on page 165. It turns out, however, that the languages we've actually created are not necessarily well suited to all those acts. So, um, so this is, I mean, it's similar to what he says about politics, right? That the, that the commonwealths we've actually created are not necessarily well suited for achieving peace. Um, so, but this is, this is the beginning of chapter 25 again. How fallacious it is to judge of the nature of things by the ordinary and inconstant use of words appeareth in nothing more than the confusion of counsels and commands arising from the imperative manner of speaking in them both. So the words do this are the words not only of him that commandeth, but also of him that giveth counsel. So, right, what he's saying here is our languages have one form, the imperative, that we use for two very different purposes. And because we use them for two very different purposes, um, they trip us up in our reasoning. Right, we, we start to get command and counsel confused with each other. So, you know, like he's thinking of various issues in the Constitution of England, like is the parliament um, a body of people who have a right to command or do they only, are they only there to counsel the king on what law? <laughs> Hobbes says the latter, right? So, I mean, um, so, so he thinks this kind of confusion is actually really politically dangerous. Um, but the point is, uh, it comes about because we haven't set up these rules of propriety of speech correctly. Um, and I guess, as you can see from that example, uh, he thinks that, so all those ends of speech, um, like, why should everyone want those things? And the answer is, well, they should want them insofar as they contribute to peace, <laughs> right? So that like ultimately the question of whether the rules of language have been set up correctly is, uh, is a political question. It's a question of whether the rules of language have been set up so as to be able to use language for certain ends to the extent that we need those ends to have a peaceful society. Um, and, uh, so the two, the two issues, the political issue and the, um, um, the issue about propriety of speech are actually connected. So this is chapter 21, paragraph nine page um, 140. In these Western parts of the world, we are made to receive our opinions concerning the institutions and rights of commonwealths from Aristotle, Cicero, and other men, Greeks and Romans. Right, so Hobbes, um, <laughs> it's like nowadays you sometimes hear people say that the West has uniquely good political institutions because of the heritage of Greek and Rome, right? At least you, you know, that's a kind of conservative thing to say. So Hobbes thinks exactly the opposite. 
Hobbes thinks the West has uniquely bad political institutions because of the heritage of Greek and Rome. <laughs> and, you know, and uh, in the 17th century, that was not such a surprising thing to say, right? Like Europe, Western Europe was a, a very unstable, unstable region, right? Like there's a constant civil wars, wars of religion, uh, you know, like religious terrorism was invented by Protestants in Holland in the 16th century. They started blowing up monasteries and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, you can kind of imagine Hobbes like in uh, Istanbul in like a, you know, a, uh, um, like on a panel, you know, where they're discussing the issues of the day saying, well, Hobbes, why is it that Western Europe is such a violent region full of fanatics and whatever? And Hobbes will say, well, you know, unfortunately, it's because they're bad political institutions. They've inherited from Greece and Rome. They're not capable of, of governing themselves properly. Right? So, you know, like that's, that's literally what he says, like the end of paragraph nine says, um, by reading of these Greek and Latin authors, men from their childhood have gotten a habit under a false show of liberty, of favoring tumults, and of licentious controlling the actions of their sovereigns, and again of controlling those controllers. With the effusion of so much blood, as I, may, I think I may truly say, there was never anything so dearly bought as these Western parts have bought the learning of the Greek and Latin tongues. Right? So, yeah, so he thinks this is terrible, but what I'm interested in here is something he says in the middle of this paragraph, towards the bottom of page 140. And because the Athenians were taught, parentheses, to keep them from desire of changing their government, that they were free men, and all that lived under monarchy were slaves, Therefore, Aristotle puts it down in his politics. In democracy, liberty is to be supposed, for it is commonly held that no man is free in any other government. So there was a way of defining the word free or liberty that was suited to the political purposes of people trying to keep the peace in Athens because Athens was a democracy. And just like any other commonwealth, you don't want the people to start thinking about trying to change their form of government. They don't have that right. And they don't have that right because it will lead to civil war. <laughs> I mean, not that's not like a argument from a premise to conclusion. That's like, you know, the the, the impediment that's stopping them from choosing their government is that otherwise there'll be civil war, changing their government is that otherwise there'll be a civil war. So you don't want them to start thinking about that. And so um, Hobbes says they defined free or liberty in such a way that it only applied to people in a democracy. And then Aristotle, not knowing the difference between science and experience, see, this is. This is also interesting because I think a lot of times you'll hear, so like the problem with uh, Aristotle is that, you know, he wasn't empirical enough. He tried to reason from first principles and he didn't learn from experience the way we do. But according to Hobbes, it's the opposite. <laughs> Aristotle didn't realize that you can't learn science from experience. And he tried to figure out the principles of government from looking at what people were doing around him. And he, so he plopped these wrong definitions into his theory. And then um, uh, after these works became revered, so actually Hobbes has an explanation why works became, become revered. And I don't know if this part was part of the assigned reading, but he says people would rather have someone who's not around to, con to compete with them be considered really smart <laughs> than someone who is around to compete with them. So that's how the ancients become revered. Anyway, so like at that point, people in monarchies where this is not a proper definition at all. And what, so they are saying, in what sense is it not a proper definition? You can define your terms however you want, 
but you shouldn't define them in a way that's going to lead to tumult and civil war. Um, and I think, um, so first of all, that throws some light on what Hobbes says in chapter 18 when he's talking about the sovereign's right to censor discourse. Um, so this is chapter 18, paragraph 19 on page 113. So he says, So this begins, sixthly, it is the next to the sovereignty, be sovereignty to be judge of what opinions and doctrines are averse and what conducing to peace, and consequently on what occasions, how far, and what men are trusted to be trusted with all. With all is like with, but like after. <laughs> At least that's one of the reasons. And what men are to be trusted with all in speaking to multitudes of people, and who shall examine the doctrines of all books before they be published? Right, so this one of the powers of the sovereignty is going to be censorship. Um, and then he goes on to say, so like, in one sense, this wasn't controversial at the time, but in another sense, it was like people were in England were increasingly making claims on behalf of freedom of speech. On the other hand, I think like most people and certainly in France, for example, it was just, yeah, it was taken for granted. Like, of course, the government has to regulate what kind of things are gonna be printed, or whatever, because it's dangerous. <laughs> As Hobbes is saying, it's like, well, obviously it's dangerous, you know, to have people going around saying any old thing. Um, okay, so, uh, so, but then Hobbes stops for an objection. And though in matter of doctrine, nothing ought to be regarded but the truth. Right, so the objection is, what do you mean the sovereign's going to decide what opinion should be taught? The true opinion should be taught. <laughs> it's not up to the sovereign. The answer is, yet this is not repugnant to regulating of the same by peace. For doctrine repugnant to, to peace can no more be true than peace and concord can be against the law of nature. So why would you think that? Like, why couldn't it be that as Plato said, or at least as Plato has Socrates argue in the Republic, whether Plato or Socrates is this is right or not, I don't know. But anyway, you know, that the best way of founding the, the perfect city is to tell everyone a lie. Like why, why couldn't that be true? So why couldn't there be a tension between, you know, the standard of doctrine truth as the standard of doctrine and peace as the standard of doctrine. Um, so I'm not sure, but I think it's probably because um, the rules of propriety of speech should be adjusted to make that come out, to make that come out true. You shouldn't be able to say something true that is um, that will undermine peace. And if words are being defined in such a way that they make it possible to say something true that's undermining peace, they're being defined wrong. <laughs> um, so. Um, so, I mean, all of this is kind of a tissue of speculations, right? Like, I mean, like some of Hobbes has to agree with most of what I'm saying in the sense that, you know, 
Pops definitely agrees that, well, so first of all, everyone knows because there's different languages that language rules of language are artificial. Okay? They're not natural or else everyone would speak the same language. Um, and, uh, um, and Hobbes definitely knows and talks about the fact that, you know, uh, how you use language can have these strong political effects. And Hobbes also says it's really important to define your terms correctly. And he spends a lot of time defining terms. Um, so like all of that is right, I guess, but, but, but you know, I wanna put it together and say, so what Hobbes thinks his, like what is the rare talent for, for political science that Hobbes thinks he has and most people don't? It's like the talent to figure out how terms should be defined to get the right conclusion. <laughs> or not, well, I mean, it's to, that is, Remember, reasoning is all going to be from definitions, according to Hobbes. So, like, um, if you don't define a certain term, then you've ruled out a whole train of reasoning. Depending on which terms you define, there's going to be different kinds of things you can prove. So that suggests that part of what Hobbes is doing in this book maybe is trying to convince us to adopt new definitions that he's figured out that will have the right effect. Um, like I said, he doesn't say that in so many words. So, um, um, So I'm not sure, but there's also there's one further consequence of that. So remember, Hobbes says that the that the people in Athens, since they were in democracy, were careful to define certain terms in such a way that it would make people want to retain the democracy, make democracy look better than other forms of government. Well, Hobbes certainly tries to make monarchy seem better than other forms of government. He goes, right, even though like his overall theory is neutral, supposedly between um, monarchy, aristocracy, and democracy. Every, right, the sovereigns have the same rights and all of them, the covenants is the same. Um, but, but then, you know, he stops to say, well, but there may be certain advantages and disadvantages of one over the other. And then it turns out that all the advantages on the side of monarchy um is that is that would he say those same things if he's living in a democracy i mean presumably he would first of all right if he was living in a democracy i think he would not say those things i think the only question is would he have a way of saying other things <laughs> it would make people want to keep their democracy or would he just have to keep Quiet. And this thing about how the truth can never be repugnant to peace makes it seem like it's the former, like he would have some way of redefining the terms and whatever to explain why democracy is better and keep that. Um, all right, that's the most I can say about that. Um, Um, I don't know if he assumes that England will be a democracy again when the war settles down. Remember, this was published and the war wasn't quite over, I guess. I mean, Charles the Fritz had already been executed, but yeah, I'm not sure why. Or is that just the best chance? <laughs> like, because they had that government. Now they don't have any government. 
I, I don't know. Anyway, all right, that's all I wanted to say about that. Uh, I don't know if there are questions. I don't know if there are questions about that because there's so little substance to it. But are there questions? Okay, so I'm going to go on to let's see which of these other two things is most important. I don't know. Yeah, I'm actually going to talk about economics first, and then if I have time, I'm going to talk about um, the subordinate political structures, like ministers and, and what he calls bodies politic, which are basically corp corporations. Um, okay, but first I want to talk about economics. So, um, right, so chapter 14 is about the nutrition of the commonwealth. Oh, sorry, not 14, 24 is about the nutrition nutrition and procreation. The procreation part is about colonies, but so the nutrition part is um, about, we would call the economy of the commonwealth. Um, right, he defines it at the very beginning. The nutrition of a commonwealth consists of in the plenty and distribution of materials conducing to life. In concoction, so concoction, so concoction literally means cooking, right? But, you know, so the ancient theory of nutrition is that when you eat food, it first has to be turned into blood. And that's step of the concoction. So, you know, it comes, food goes in and blood goes out. So um, the concoction and when concocted in the conveyance of it by convenient conduits to the public use, use right? So once it's turned into blood, then it, well, of course, uh, um, in ancient times, they didn't know that blood circulates. Hobbes already knows that. But it, they, they knew that the blood somehow went to the other parts of the body. Nurture, nurture them there, right? But anyway, so Hobbes knows that the blood circulates. So the Commonwealth has a similar, similar process. And um, what's analogous to blood is money. So the materials that are needed to life are first concocted into money and then circulated. Um, So that's what this or this part of this chapter is about. Um, and uh, Hobbes seems to assume, I mean, it's not at all clear that he's that he's saying you should do this, or if he's just describing what usually happens. But he seems to assume that the economy will mostly be a free market. I mean, this is uh, chapter 21, paragraph six, when he's talking about the liberty of a subject. And he gives a list of the things that people will, um, where people will mostly be free to decide what to do because the law will be silent. Um, and he gives these examples, such as is the liberty to buy and sell and otherwise contract with one another, um, choose their own abode, their own diet, their own trade of life, and to institute, that is, educate their children as they themselves think fit and the like. Right? So he says normally the Commonwealth will allow. Uh, well, I guess by but by institute he means educate, but I think he means like educate into a trade, right? Not like teach, uh, you know, because the sovereign is going to decide what what will be taught in terms of doctrine. Right? So um, 
But all those other things like buying and selling and so forth, he assumes that for the most part, the law is gonna be silent. Um, and, um, and I think, you know, most of the other main principles of liberal or, you know, you could call it capitalist economics, but of course this is, this is before the developments that according to Mar Marx led to an accumulation of capital, right? Like it's before industrialization and so forth. So it's not strictly speaking, right? To, I mean, there's capitalist is Marx's terminology, right? So it's not strictly speaking, right? They call this society capitalist, but it's, you know, in a looser sense, obviously it's, it's like the society he's describing is one where um, people like, are on their own to go, you know, make money and uh, hire themselves out and buy and sell and whatever. Um, okay, so that's the way he describes the society in a commonwealth. Now, I mean, again, it's not, um, it's not clear that he thinks you should do that. He also certainly doesn't think that there's an absolute right to that, right? He emphasizes over and over that all property is created by the sovereign. I mean, it's created by the commonwealth, but the, com but the sovereign represents the commonwealth. So, um, so there can be no there can no be no property rights against the sovereign, right? So if the sovereign says, you know. I'm taking your house. <laughs> That's the end of the story. <laughs> um, so in other words, like, I guess you could say that in terms of where he thinks the right of property comes from, he's actually a socialist, right? But he thinks all property is created by society and that society has the right to, in the person of the sovereign, has the right to redistribute it as they see fit. But on the other hand, he, he thinks that what they mostly will do is just let people buy and sell and whatever they want. Okay, so, so far so good. But what's a little bit weird is then when you put this together with the 12th and 13th laws of nature. So I read the um, 13th law of nature before, I think. That's the one about um, dividing by lot. But, um, So this is in paragraph, in chapter 15, paragraph 25. So actually paragraph 24 is the law of equity, which is, is important that the following laws are supposed to be a consequence of the law of equity. Um, actually it starts in paragraph 23, the 11th law of nature, the law of equity. Also, if a man be trusted to judge between man and man, it is a precept of the law of nature that he deal equally between them. That's equity. And then, so here's the 12th law. And from this followeth another law, that such things as cannot be divided be enjoyed in common if it can be. And if the quantity of the thing permit without stint, otherwise proportionably to the number of them that have, the, that have right. For otherwise the distribution is unequal and contrary to equity. Right, so things that can't be divided should be common to everyone, he's saying, and things that can be divided should be divided equally. Well, actually he says, if there's things that can be divided, if there's enough of them, then we can let everyone use as much as they want like the way air and water used to be. <laughs> Not exactly true anymore, right? Uh, actually, it wasn't as, I think, is it Locke who's gonna discuss this? It certainly hasn't, it wasn't always true of water, right? Like there's a lot of stories in the Bible of people arguing over wells and stuff, you know. But, um, but air, I guess, no one had to worry that all the air would be used up or polluted. Or, <laughs> Um, so anyway, you know, so if it, like if there's that much of it, then you just say everyone can use it without stint. But if there's not that much of it, 
then proportionably to the number of them that have the rights. That is, it should be divided up equally. And then the 13th law following that is the one that says, oh, but like, if it can't be divided equally, if it can't be divided, and it can't be enjoyed in common, then the whole right has to go to someone by lot. And that means either to the person who gets it first or to the firstborn. So, um, So it's weird that the law of nature says that things have to be divided equally if they can be, but uh, in civil society, um, uh, they're not divided equally. Um, now, I mean, of course, civil society is not the state of nature. So, you know, you can say, well, yeah, in a state of nature, you have to decide, divide things equally. I mean, like for sure, Hobbes does think that in civil society, the sovereign can divide things in any old way. This is um, chapter 24. Paragraph six on page 161. Um, he's talking about the children of Israel coming into the land out of the desert. And he says, um, it was divided amongst them, not by their own discretion, but by the discretion of Eleazar the priest and Joshua their general. I mean, it's weird that there's two there, right? Like one of them should be the sovereign, not the other. Elsewhere, Hobbes tries to prove that the high priest was always the sovereign of Israel until the beginning of the monarchy, which is very, very hard to fit to the text. But anyway, I guess he's thinking here that it's really al -Azhar, But so who, when there were 12 tribes, making them 13 by subdivision of the tribe of Joseph, made nevertheless but 12 portions of the land and ordained for the tribe of Levi no land, but assigned them the 10th part of the whole fruits, which division was therefore arbitrary, right? So he's saying that, you know, there were, so there were 12 tribes, um, but So there were, tell, there were 12 tribes, but one of them, or there were 12 ch sons of Joseph, really. I mean, sorry, of Jacob, but one of them, Joseph, that tribe got divided into two, into two tribes. Um, so, I mean, he makes it sound like it was Joshua and Elazar who did that, but actually it was clearly done a lot, long time before that in the story, but never mind that. So this is divided into two tribes, but then, uh, so you'd think, okay, there's 13 tribes and they should divide the land up into 13 portions. But he says, no, but instead they took one tribe, Levi, and said, oh, you're not getting any land. You're just getting a tithe of the fruits from everyone else. So that was therefore arbitrary. I mean, this whole way of telling the story is kind of weird. Like, it's, it's you know, um, I think you can understand how, what Hobbes really thinks happened here by the way he tells the story. Because if you read the Bible, it's like God says, this is how you should divide the land. And, you know, this will be the law of the Levites. They will, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But from Hobbes' point of view, like God says things only through an authorized representative. So the authorized representative is the one who's actually doing it. <laughs> um, so, uh, 
Right. So anyway, but this this was arbitrary. So they didn't divide, you know. So so you can tell from this that Hobbes thinks that, yeah, the sovereign um uh doesn't have to divide things up. Um, and presumably, again, the sovereign has the right not to divide things up equally because the sovereign is our authorized agent, and uh, you know, this so Levi authorized them. Um, right, so that's similar to what he says about like if in a commonwealth. I make a covenant um, to someone under threat of violence. So remember, Hobbes says in a state of nature, a covenant made under threat of violence is, is binding, just like any other. In foro interno, <laughs> it's not really binding, but, but I mean, unless it's the covenant that makes the commonwealth. But anyway, you know, so a covenant made under threat of violence is binding. He says, so why do we think covenants made under threat of violence, violence aren't binding? Because we have laws against them. Um, and so, uh, um, and the way he explains this, this is back in chapter 20, paragraph two on page 128. Um, when the sovereign who is the actor, right, meaning agent, when the sovereign who is the actor acquitteth him, acquitteth, right, so the situation here is this, like I made a promise to pay you certain money under threat, but now there's a law that says I don't have to pay it back. And the question is, how can that be? I made a promise. And the answer is, when the sovereign who is the actor acquitted him, then he is acquitted by him that extorted the promise <clears throat> as by the author of such absolution, right? Because the sovereign is, at, so the, this person said, you know, pay me money or else. And I say, oh, yes, I will. And then they later they say, where's the money? And I say, well, you know, that promise wasn't binding because of this law. Um, meaning your agent, the sovereign, has let me off. <laughs> um, you authorized the sovereign to let me out of the debt that you paid. So there was really a debt, but it was, but, but, but it was, um, uh, it was remitted by the creditor through their agent. <laughs> Right, so similarly, you know, here we can say, like, you know, like I guess, like the Levi did actually have a right to the port to a portion, but they, you know, gave it up through their agent. So I mean, all that is kind of okay, except um, now I don't understand when these laws of nature are supposed to hold. So, I mean, I was kind of glossing over this before, but if, if you say they're supposed to hold in, in a state of nature, well, they, you know, none of the laws of nature bind in foro externo in a state of nature. Again, in foro externo, right, in an external forum means binding you to actually do something. <laughs> yeah. Isn't the sovereign always acting, operating in state of nature? So, technically, not the law. Well, um, okay, I talked about this before and I'm about to talk about it again a little bit and I'll talk about it more later, I think. But so the sovereign is in a state of nature, but this is why it's important and it's gonna get more important and confusing as we go on, that the state of nature, um, you know, you can think of it, of it two different ways. 
I think before I called this the individual state of nature and like the international state of nature. But, you know, but there's more types than just that, but it's like, we call this the original state of nature. Like there's the state of nature as just as an abstraction, meaning that there's no law that covers us both. Then we're in a state of nature with respect to each other. And then there's the state of nature as like a specific way that all human beings could be living together. The original individual state of nature, like right when there's no commonwealth and so on, right? So like, you know, um, so when you say, for example, that in a state of nature, no one has the power to over to um, to reliably defeat anyone else, you're talking about this state of nature, right? There, it's it's individual human beings he's thinking about when he says even the weakest has the power enough to kill the strongest. Whereas when you say something like the sovereign is still in the state of nature, it's this state of nature. So like you know. Here's the Commonwealth. And okay, so suppose for the sake of argument, because it's gonna be weirder with other forms, suppose it's a monarchy. So here's the sovereign. All right, so here's the sovereign. So they're in a state of nature, meaning there's no judge above the monarchy, black or quick, right? Um, but it's not true that like all these people put together couldn't overpower this one. So, I mean, um, now, I mean, they can only act together through their representative. So, uh, so like that, that simple, like way of looking at it isn't that I just suggested isn't exactly right, but what is right is that um, if the sovereign doesn't deal correctly with this huge bunch of people here, everything's going to fall apart, and at that point, their life is in danger, <laughs> right? Um, so, like, what they have to reckon with here is quite different from what individuals have to reckon with. In the state of nature with respect to each other. There may, there may be really bad consequences for the sovereign violating the laws of nature, but there wouldn't be in the individual state of nature. Yeah. So, um, uh, I mean, we'll see when we get to Locke and Rousseau, they start building in more and more historical assumptions about the state of nature. Like there weren't very many people then. Right then, it doesn't apply to this at all. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, but in, but it's already it's already a problem in Hobbes, and he doesn't. Um, I think he notices this and uses it, but he doesn't call attention to it. Um, so, uh, um, right. But again, so I guess I won't get to that thing about bodies politic today. Probably, maybe I'll get to it next time. I think it's important. Um, but, um, so it's hard to understand, like, in this, in, in this state of nature anyway, in the individual state of nature, I mean, maybe, maybe I've already given away what I think might be the answer here, but like in an individual state of nature, those laws, um, of equal division and, and, and uh, assignment by lot uh, don't have any force to get people to do anything, to cause them to wish for something. So they can wish that everything were fairly distributed. They should, but uh, they don't have to do anything about it. But then in civil society, like, um, as soon as it's formed, those laws apparently can get overridden right away. So when do those laws have any? 
about division, right? Um, so chapter 21, paragraph seven on page 138 says, This is right after the part I was just reading about the liberties of the subject, right? And then he, the next paragraph starts, nevertheless, we are not to understand by, by, that by such liberty, the sovereign power of life and death is either abolished or limited. For it has already been shown, right? So this is right after he says that for the most part in commonwealths, people have the right to do what they want with their property and so forth. He says, yeah, for the most part, they do, but we're not to understand that by such liberty, the sovereign power of life and death is either abolished or limited. For it has already been shown that nothing the sovereign representative can do to a subject on what pretense soever can properly be called injustice or injury, because every subject is author of every act the sovereign, do the sovereign doth, so that he never wants a right to anything. And then in parentheses, otherwise than as he himself is the subject of God and bound thereby to observe the laws of nature. Right, so again, like in this situation, um, it seems like Hobbes is saying, so um, no one, No one has the right to, under the laws of the Commonwealth, to challenge anything the sovereign does. The sovereign comes and uh, takes away your vineyard or um, sleeps with your wife and then sends you out into battle to get killed. These are both biblical stories, right? That, that, that uh, Hobbes mentions both of them. Um, so you don't have any right to complain because you authorized that. <laughs> um, but nevertheless, Hobbes says the sovereign wants right to do certain things, right? That is, doesn't have the right to do certain things. Now, what can that mean? So remember, like, if you don't have the right to do something, that means there's an impediment. And uh, of course, he's not saying that there's a wall that prevents the sovereign from taking people's vineyards or whatever, because clearly there isn't. So what is it? What's the impediment? Now, um, so it could mean, and I'm gonna talk about this later, what, like, what, in what sense Hobbes might agree with this, but what he would mean by it. It could mean that like the sovereign is afraid of divine punishment. Right, the God whose subject he is will punish him if he violates the laws of nature. Um, but, um, So I'm not sure actually how he understands the biblical stories of prophets coming to the kings and saying, you did the wrong thing, you're going to be punished. But, you know, however he understands that, it's like, you know, um, only the king is, is authorized to speak for God, <laughs> according to Hobbes. So, um, so how, could, how could this, again, assuming this is a monarchy, Right? I mean, if this is a democracy, in some ways, the situation is easier to understand. You know, like if the assembly of everyone violates the laws of nature, then probably the Commonwealth is going to fall apart. <laughs> At least that's what they should be worried about. But anyway, like it, it, it's, but it's easier to draw if it's a monarchy. So, you know, here the sovereign 
how does the sovereign know that God is going to punish them? They violate the laws of nature. Um, so if, like, if, this, if that means something supernatural, the answer referring to Hobbes is they, they can't know that. They might believe it irrationally, right? But they can't know that because reasoning is all, you know, um, uh, well, see, actually, this isn't so clear. But anyway, it seems like, according to Hobbes, reasoning only reaches natural common sense. So what, what could be the impediment here? And I think the impediment is what I was saying, that in this case, the laws of nature do bind in foro external, because the commonwealth is already in existence. So, the the sovereign, you know, um, does face bad consequences if they stop being equitable. And um, so that's in fact what he says about the story of David and Uriah. That's the one I mentioned where David. Um, Chapter 21, paragraph 7 on page 139. So, right, so King David um, uh, decides he wants to marry Uriah's wife. So Hobbes says, um, So at the beginning of this paragraph, Hobbes is talking about how a subject may be put to death by command of the sovereign power, and yet neither do the other wrong, right? So like someone could have done nothing wrong and the sovereign decide to kill them anyway, right? Like to kill an innocent person. And Hobbes says that although the person who was killed was innocent, so was the sovereign. Because the sovereign had a right to kill them. But then he adds, and the same holdeth also. Well, so is it, well, never mind. And the same holdeth also in a sovereign prince that putteth to de putteth to death an innocent subject. For though the action be against the law of nature, as being contrary to equity. So remember, equity is the eleventh law that you should deal equally with everyone. So Hobbes is saying that punishing innocent people is contrary to the law of equity. Um, as being contrary to equity, as was the killing of Uriah by David, yet it was not an injury to Uriah, but to God. Not to Uriah, because the right to do what he pleased was given him by Uriah himself, and yet to God, because David was God's subject and prohibited all iniquity by the law of nature which distinction David himself, when he repented the fact, evidently confirmed, saying, to thee only have I sinned. Okay, that's an example of Hobbes' biblical interpretation. So, um, so it looks like, as far as the 11th law of nature goes, the law of equity, Hobbes is saying, yes, as far as the commonwealth goes, there's the king doesn't have to observe it. So the king can just like, you know, if we ask the king to judge between us, the king can just favor me instead of you for no good reason. Or the king can just take away my stuff for no good reason, kill me because he wants to sleep with my wife or whatever, right? So um, all of that is true from the point of view of the subjects, but the law of nature still binds the king um, and uh, um, if the king violates the, the law of equity in those ways, the king has violated the law of nature. So, I mean, whether it's because of some supernatural reason, which you might think if you read the biblical story, or if it's because of the reason I think I, I, I believe Hobbes has in mind, which is the one I was just discussing. He is saying 
that the law of equity binds the sovereign in foro externo. Right? The sovereign can violate the law of equity by doing something. Um, so, uh, and you can understand based on my explanation, right? It's true that the, the people don't have a right to complain if the sovereign starts killing innocent people left and right. But if it gets to the point that you're no more likely to be killed um, uh, for committing a capital crime than just to be killed for no good reason, then um, the artificial chains that hold the Commonwealth together are gonna fail, right? People have to know that they'll be safe if they keep the law and they're in danger if they break the law. That's why they're keeping the law. If it becomes just as dangerous to observe the law as to break the law, then there won't be a law. <laughs> so, um, so, so, you know, so you can see therefore why the, the sovereign in this weird situation, although they're in the state of nature, nevertheless, the laws of nature bind them differently than you would expect. But then, you know, so I still don't understand going back to the 12th and 13th law, why those don't bind the sovereign, right? Why doesn't the sovereign have to constantly redistribute everything in the Commonwealth to make sure everyone has an equal portion? I don't know. and. Unfortunately, this is, I'm out of time, but fortunately this is the last thing I want to say. This is uh, chapter 24, paragraph seven on page 162. It says, um, but in what cases the commands of sovereigns are contrary to equity and the law of nature is to be considered hereafter in another place. And if you look in the footnote, down here, you'll see that Curly, the editor, doesn't really know what place he's talking about. <laughs> there isn't a place place where he clearly comes back to this. So, um, so you have to just kind of guess why he thinks apparently that some laws of nature bind the sovereign and others don't. Okay, that's all. We'll see you on Thursday.